Thank you very much for all coming down um, to this meeting about the, the terrible Grenfell Tower fire. We want to talk about the truth about Grenfell Tower. That means not just the fire, but actually about the tower itself and the estate it's on. And we want to sort of try to combat the very negative perceptions which are being spread in the press about these estates. And specifically, the idea that the reaction to this fire is to pull down every tower block, estate tower block in London. Because that's a narrative which has really caught hold and is a very, very dangerous one. The other reason we're holding this meeting is because last Saturday, Annette, where is Annette? There you are. Who's the, are you still the chair or? Okay, not. But she's on the TRA for Cotton Gardens Estate. She, we ran into her and she said, bloody hell, I've, got, I've already got over 50 residents on this estate alone ringing me up saying, is it safe here? Um, which is, a, I think, a clear reaction um, to the kind of fear-mongering that's being spread and the kind of disinformation that's being spread about the safety of these tower blocks. We're going to divide the meeting into, I guess, sort of 25-minute slots. The first one is to share what we know, to share what we know collectively about the technical causes of the Grenfell Tower fire. The second thing we want to address is to expose the political and bureaucratic decisions that allowed those technical conditions to be put in place. Okay? So you've got the technical conditions that led to the fire, or caused the fire, spread the fire, but also we want to look at the political and bureaucratic decisions that put those in place. Because um, I think that's something which is being left out in the kind of more general conversation about this fire. The third thing we're going to do, having, <clears throat> if you like, accumulated this knowledge about the reasons, the causes of the fire, is then to try and come to some sort of, uh, um, make some reassurances or come to some judgment about the extent to which council tower blocks in London are or are not safe. And obviously what we can do about it if they're not safe. And the final thing we're going to talk about is because <clears throat> we, are a, uh, we are a housing campaign group as well as an architectural group, is what we can do how we can organize to oppose this narrative that all estates are dangerous, therefore we should pull them down. That because the Grenfell Tower fire happened, therefore all, all tower blocks and all estates are compromised. Um, so that's the four things we're going to have a look at here. We know some people who live on the Silchester estate, which is directly opposite of it, and they actually live at the foot of the tower. And they showed us some footage which they took. And as we know, it started on the fourth floor, but the flames went up this far left corner. And they said from going from the fire starting, it went up around the corner of the building. The cladding created a kind of a box around what was a triangle of the corner. So you've got the corner and then a box cladding around it here. And they said it simply shot straight up like a chimney. And there was this great big long line of flame. And then this flame then moved laterally across the cladding but in a diagonal because it started at the bottom like this. And all the photos that we're seeing coming out of this confirms this is exactly what happened. Uh, just a really important thing in terms of the, uh, the kind of work that we do, which was said by uh, Arnold Tarling, who's a Chartered Surveyor and Fire Safety Specialist on the BBC, I think, through the tears. The fire would not have spread if the building had not been altered. And I think that's really, really important when we're thinking about our existing estates. Were and fire stops not installed or really installed important. wrongly? That building had not been altered, Why were there no alarms? Fire would not have spread. Should it people have stayed it, put? It gone anywhere. So the, a building, as a, from an architectural point of view, as a designer, a building is the sum of its parts. So you change one aspect of that building and you need to change the way you think about it holistically as a whole. So you know, when you design a building, the fire escapes, the fire safety, the, the materials, that's all part of it. You change one of those things, you change everything, and that's absolutely crucial. When people start to engage and alter a building, they need to understand that they're altering the way in which it operates as a system. The first question, why did the fire spread? So, started inside uh, the building, potentially uh, some kind of faulty wiring, uh, or fridge blowing up, something like that. Again, we don't really know. We're not, we try not to speculate in here. If we don't know something, we don't know. I think that's important to say what we do and we don't know. We know a fire started. Uh, and it sounded like, as far as I know, there were some fire people that were called to that fire and thought they'd put it out. Um, so evidently, then I think, I don't know whether they then left, but then there, somehow the fire had to get from the inside to the outside. 
you know, there are all sorts of holes in walls. Ventilation, uh, ducts, all those sorts of things. They obviously need to be protected themselves, need to have fire protection around them, fire stopping. We don't necessarily know about the, you know, the, 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 um, the workmanship of those holes. Did they seal them all up? You know, was, there a, was there something new that had gone in that allowed the passage of fire through that hole? Um, so then it gets to the outside, and one of the things that struck me when I first heard about this particular cladding method is that you have this insulation, which is seen there as the yellow, which is stuck on fixed back, screwed back into the existing concrete, and it's about 15 centimetres thick. And then you've got a gap, uh, which, is a kind of, which is called a cavity, a ventilation cavity, um, which essentially is about letting any moisture build up within that kind of construction, letting that sort of drip out. Um, and the insulation has a kind of foil front on it, it's a sort of very thin sort of foil sort of surface. Um, so yeah, so what you get is you get a chimney effect. You know how chimneys work, you have uh, you know, uh, air at the top and hot air at the bottom and you get a kind of movement of, a movement of air and that air ends up drawing, uh, like a chimney does, drawing the heat up. Um, so again, that's another thing that people have, people have uh, uh, been aware of as possibly fueling the fire which started at the bottom and the speed with which it went. So these are just some of the drawings of the, of the cladding. Um, and you can see the columns, interestingly, and there's a, the column here has an even greater <laughs> gap. So if we're talking about this idea of this chimney effect, the gap around the column here is even bigger than, than, it, than, than going up anywhere else. And on the corner, it would probably be even bigger again. So if we're looking at that chimney effect of like, having the air dragging the flames up the building, then it seems, it seems quite clear that something's, something's happening there. And interestingly, you know, this, this, this insulation wraps inside the building. So again, we were talking about how does it get out of the building from the far inside and how does it get from the inside to the out. This, the insulation, this is all wrapping around there. So there's a huge kind of like break through this sort of supposedly sort of, you know, protective barrier. Um, but there's no, there's no fire. So a fire break is something that would be horizontally stop that, that gap, basically. Um, okay. And in theory, they're meant to be provided, but I can't see them anyway. There was a little detail shown in the garden. What is uh, how authentic it is, uh, I don't know. But it showed that there was a fire stop at each floor. Hmm. However, the fire stop stopped short of the ventilation gap. Hmm. And in the, the external panel, the rain screen was itself flammable. Right, yeah. That fire stop was doing absolutely nothing. Nothing, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I mean, the fire stop, if the fire is only going up here, if this is non-flammable, the fire, then, then it would stop it. But it, as you say, if this is flammable, then it's not going to do anything, is it? Yeah. Okay. That's just showing, like, basically, so this is showing, you know, how you fix, so this is looking down, sort of a, a horizontal plan of the building, so that's how you fix these metal brackets, basically. So the metal brackets will fix back in through the concrete. And this is something quite interesting that somebody brought up, one of our members brought up, was that, you know, this also compromises the integrity of the, arch of the, of the concrete. So these concrete buildings, they're there, but they've got, they've got reinforcement bars inside, which is generally about five centimetres. You've got five centimetres of concrete, and then you've got your reinforcement bars. And so, you know, these are going to, they're going to break through that, and they're going to potentially let moisture in, let water inside. So they basically, they're not really doing your existing concrete structure any favours at all. They're making it potentially worse. So again, we're looking at what do these modifications do. Um, you know, even just things like fixing something to the existing structure is going to potentially damage it. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll move along. Um, and that's, so that's this thing that these, these um, you can see where these fixings go through into the existing structure. And this, this, this guy was here saying moisture penetration can destroy reinforced concrete and can shorten the life of the building. So cladding does not fix internal problems, makes them worse. Yeah, I just want to make a point just based on a number of different yeah. council blocks that I've lived in and gone through refurbs. I think gaps are a really big issue, the gaps between the different materials, which as any architect knows, you've got to detail those things so carefully, especially around fire prevention. And I, I don't, in a number of cases, I think, one, we probably find that there aren't any detailed drawings, mm. and two, I'm not sure that inspections happen to check how the gaps are being handled. Yeah. And so many of the contracts are subcontracted out to different groups, mm. and I think that that isn't monitored either. Yeah. But I just have a feeling that these gaps are probably where some of the problem lies, yeah. as well as the actual specification of the material. Yeah, absolutely right. yeah. So this is the specification 
for that cladding. This, you know, this is what they actually, what they actually, what they actually installed, what was paid for, I suppose, essentially. Um, and so this says um, column cladding, mezzanine and above. So that's those kind of, um, that's the columns on the outside. They're sort of slightly, uh, they're sort of a rotated square. Um, co aluminium composite panel, Rainer Bond, rain screen cassette. Um, and the other one, solid spandrel rain screen panels, which are basically the ones that are fixed on to the, to the kind of uh, the, the external walls. Uh, and that's the same thing. So, yeah, so aluminium composite panel. And interestingly, I don't think I've got an image of this, but if you look at the original design drawings, it's not an aluminium cassette at all, it's zinc. So it's something else. So at some point, there was a design which potentially got, may have got signed off by somebody, and at some point down the way, that changed. So does that actually say revocable? Does it specify, yes, it does. Does it specify which of the two? No, it doesn't. That's, that's why, I, as far as I can see, it doesn't specify which one. What's the significance of the difference between the two? Well, the difference between the two uh, is actually the crucial difference, isn't it? So there's two panels, one of which has a fire rating of something, and the other one doesn't. Um, and, and so, I mean, it, yeah, so essentially, that, well, that, that's the theory. Absolutely. We don't know what was actually installed. That's, we don't know. Once their panel is also, you can't see what's inside it. So once yeah. it's there, you've got no idea, really, of what's... Hi, I just also wondered, do we know if the aluminium itself caught fire? Because aluminium burns really hot. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think there, was a, there is a video that I saw which they, were te they tested one of those panels. And, and yeah, the whole thing did, did just did burn. So yeah, eventually the aluminium does. And interesting, somebody on our page mentioned the fact that not all, not all fires respond to water very well. Mm. And is it magnesium yeah. fires or something? So there may well aluminium be... Aluminium would have been worse if you got molten aluminium. Well, yeah. So, so you're kind of, you, you know, you're sort of, you're, you're sort of pump, you're pumping water at this thing. And actually, maybe that's not necessarily the best, the best thing either. Okay. So, yeah. So this is just quickly, yeah, shows the kind of build-ups. You've got the concrete, the insulation, and this kind of gap, and then this cladding panel, uh, which is the thing that went up uh, in flames. And that's just that looks at this core, which is this kind of. So when one talks about plastic, essentially the outside is metal. Uh, it was, uh, it was aluminium, and the, it's the inside which is this kind of polyethylene core, which is the flammable bit. Uh, the yellow stuff. Oh, the yellow So that's stuff. the thermal insulation, that's yeah. 15 centimetres, and that was oh, this stuff called Celotex. It's quite thick. Yeah, it's thick. that's the thermal thing, that's what yeah. keeps it, that's what, that's what regulates the, the temperature, basically. Oh, that, right. So their argument is they're putting it on to improve the energy performance of the building. And that has a class, that has a certain, uh, that has a kind of classification which is called class zero, which you would think class zero, you can't get any better than that, can you? But actually, it doesn't mean it's not combustible. Oh, right. So, well, that's what uh, I found. I think there are two terms which are getting confused. One is spread of flame. I think there's class zero spread of flame. Mm. That doesn't mean it's non-combustible. Yeah. And then there's the fire resistance, which is the length of time it would take for a fire playing on it yeah. for a certain length of time to get through, which is yeah. for a containment in a high building would normally be one hour. Yeah. So um, this this building will be have one hour fire resistance. Um, I thought, being elderly, that the uh, installation of gas pipes and tablets was one of the recommendations after the 1968 Rome Point oh. explosion. Yeah. The gas pipe shouldn't be fitted in any, any building above five storeys. Is yeah. that true? I can That's answer that. Possible. After the Roman Point disaster, gas had to be taken out of any of the big panel system buildings, such as this one. It was still permitted in buildings with um, in situ concrete frames, which uh, would apply to Grenville Tower. But what is illegal, completely illegal, is to have an unprotected, exposed pipe carrying gas in an escape route. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And I was surprised myself, to be honest. I, I couldn't really understand. And I think, you know, the, 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 you know when you put something like that, it, it, would have case, it would have casing around it. So uh, one of the things about, like, these blocks as well, and the Grenville as well, the way in which fire is, is understood is in compartments. So your, your building would be compartmentalised. Um, and so, and the way in which we, we talked about things, 
penetrating through walls, the way you kind of contain them, and services obviously also travel vertically through the building, the way you contain them is by things like uh, um, um, plasterboard. But obviously that still only has an hour's, you know, kind of a fire resistance, maybe two hours. But obviously there is going to be a point at which that fails. I mean, this was burning for, what, 24 hours or something, so if that, you know, if that, if that protection, you know, a fire door maybe takes, is a one hour, two hour fire door, there will be a point where that, that then fails as well. So even those precautions of, you know, of kind of, uh, of containing something um, is potentially not, not adequate. All gas pipes now shouldn't even be running up service calls on the interior of blocks. They were moving all the gas pipes to the exterior of the block for safety reasons. I don't know if that applies across, but that's definitely what was going on in the suburbs. So you mean that was retrospectively or retrospective. in new builds? No, retrospectively. Exactly. We've looked something at the actual why this, what should have been a localised fire. We think it was a, a, fridge, a fridge blew up, which should have been contained within a safe area, as fires generally are on these, on these estates. Why, we've seen kind of why, or some of the reasons why it's spread and turned into this, literally into this inferno. What I want to look at now is <clears throat> how this happened, why those lethal conditions were in place, how that could have happened. And I want to look at the bureaucratic structures that led to this, and I also want to have a look at the political decisions that made that were behind these structures and this technical conditions being put in place. Now, it's, it's very important that these are about facts, that we're producing knowledge here, not simply opinions. Anyone who's, who's been consulted, any resident here who's been consulted as part of a consultation process by a council knows that Absolutely everything you said is used to justify it. As uh, Murray knows over there, um, Lib Peck, the leader of Lambeth, Lambeth uh, Council, started the consultation on the regeneration of Central Hill Estate and Crescent Gardens by asking residents, would you like a new, a new kitchen? That's led to them now being told that their, their, their entire estate is going to be demolished. What's being, this, is, this is what I'm kind of saying about it. We've got to be careful about opinions about estates made often by people who don't know anything about them being then taken as kind of knowledge or gospel about it. Let me just go on to, this kind of addresses maybe your question or your, your statement. This is something which, was, I think it came out of The Guardian or something. It was about the contractual structure that led to the technical conditions being put in place that we've just looked at. At the centre here, you've got Kensington and Chelsea Tenant Management Organisation. And it... It shows the subcontractors, the, 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 the businesses, the private businesses, that they contracted out the refurbishment of the estate. So before, before we get on to why the estate was refurbished, let's look at how it was refurbished. Yeah? Now, one of the things they did is they contracted out this company called Artelia UK. Now, that's a, that's a private company which specialises in cost management. Now, they were contracted by Kensington and Chelsea to be the project managers on the Grenfell Tower refurbishment, which was last year. Okay? Now, on its website page, on residential services, Artelia says that, and I'm quoting here, it works closely with our clients to understand what success looks like to them, to the client. Okay? Nothing about the residents here. And how we can make that success a reality. Now, among its experiences, as it calls it, the company lists precisely refurbishment projects for local authorities. Okay, so this is not a one-off, it's something that's done a lot of the time. On its page on health and safety management, it says its management of health and safety results in a, quote, safer, better, more cost-effective project. On its page on design and construction management, and this is what it's doing here when it's doing this refurbishment, it says, we take full responsibility for architects, engineers, contractors, and suppliers in a seamless process that drives out inefficiencies. So this company is saying on its own website that it is responsible for all the subcontractors here, the people who supply the parts, the people who put them on, the people who do the design, okay? So you kind of think this is the people that we're looking at to take responsibility for this. But it's not quite as simple as that. On the page describing its involvement in the Grenfell Tower refurbishment project, Artelia says 
that it was, it was appointed as the employer's agent, the employer here being Kensington Chelsea Tenant Management Organization, as the quantity surveyor and as, and this is the one I want to focus on, the construction design and management coordinator, the CDM coordinator. <laughs> so I looked up what is a construction design and management coordinator, and it says that they are responsible for, its role is, I'm going to read out these, to advise the client, Kensington Chelsea TMO, on matters relating to health and safety during the design process and during the planning phases of construction. It's also there, its role is also to notify the health and safety executive of the particulars specified in Schedule 1 of the regulations, to advise the client as to the adequacy of the resources used, to coordinate health and safety aspects of the design work, to advise on the suitability, coordination and compatibility of design in relation to health and safety, to advise on the adequacy of the construction phase plan before construction works begins, to advise on the adequacy of any changes to the construction phase plan, and finally, to prepare or compile the health and safety file and issue it to the client at the end of the construction phase. So their role is completely encasing and containing all the health and safety issues relating to this fire. However, on the 6th of April 2015, so about a year before this, um, the construction design and management regulations were changed. And the role of the coordinator was transferred to the principal designer who is responsible for the pre-construction phase. So in the case of Grenfell Tower, this is Studio E Architects, the people here, okay? And to the principal contractor who is responsible for the construction phase. And in this case, this is this company you've heard a lot about, Ryden, who are the people who were uh, uh, responsible for putting the cladding on. So it's unclear at this point what Artelia's role is, because it seems, according to these regulations, that it's been devolved to the architects and to the company who is the, re the refurbishment company. Now, <clears throat> under these new CDM regulations, the client, which is in this case is Kensington and Chelsea TMO, is responsible for, and I quote, ensuring that both the principal designer and contractor, so Studio E, Studio e Architects and Ryden, are complying with their duties and for making health and safety executive notification. But it also notes that <clears throat> in the Architects Journal, when they were talking about these change regulations, it says, this may be difficult for architects where the principal designer has no contractual authority over the people who are working for them. Now, I went onto Studio E Architects' website and it says it will be ready to assist the relevant authorities as and when we are required. They also describe the Grenfell fire as a tragic incident. Now, then I also went onto Ryden's uh, website, the principal contractor, and they say, as I think the gentleman over there said, it said, their work met all required building regulations as well as fire regulation and health and safety standards, and that the handover took place when completion notice was issued by the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea building control. They also described the fire as a tragedy. Now, the completion certificate, <laughs> it's very hard to follow this, but this is this, it's kind of the way this, this kind of labyrinthine thing kind of works. This completion certificate <coughs> issued by Kensington and Chelsea planning control manager says that as far as could be ascertained, after taking all reasonable steps, the building work carried out on the refurbishment of Grenfell Tower complied with the relevant provisions. But it also adds, this certificate is evidence, but not conclusive evidence, that the relevant requirements specified below, that is Schedule 1, have been complied with. It's not quite finished. <laughs> the Kensington Chelsea Council website, if you go onto their the, the, the page in which they talk about this, it says the work was completed but not approved. But then they've got another page saying, this does not mean, and I'm quoting them here, that the work was not approved under the building regulations. They go on to explain the formal signing off of the work 
was provided by a completion certificate and not by a full plans decision notice, which they say was not required in this place. In other words, does, any, does an architect want to explain this to us, to us all, exactly what this means? What is the difference? Why was a not a full plans notice required for this enormous work? If you go to the self-certified route, then the local authority itself doesn't actually ask for or um, check the building works as regards to full plans in that way. I mean, I think that was what I had originally thought as well, because yeah, there's a new system which started not that long ago called approved inspectors, which basically is a privatisation of this whole process, which basically says you can pay a private guy to certify your building for you. Um, and that's, I think that's what you're talking about. I think, in fact, in this case, I don't think that is what happened. I'm not entirely, although I'm actually not sure. But there are these two systems. There's a full plans application, which means that you design the whole building or all the works, and then you submit those plans to the local authority in advance. They then have six weeks to look over those plans, make sure everything is okay. You then get a go-ahead, and then you start the work. That's not what they did. They did something called a building notice, which I was very surprised when I heard. This, you would normally use this on a very small project, where you basically you, you just tell them two days before the works begins, and you just tell them it's going to start, um, and, um, and then they just come and certify it as you go along. Planning permission runs out after a certain time, and the, and, and the putting in a building notice would somehow they say, well, we started building. And I think your other point was cost, because basically this means you can start sooner, but it means you're starting on site before you've actually finished designing the thing yet. So and uh, you know so uh, it's definitely a cost, definitely cost saving exercise uh, and time because you're starting sooner. And then there's less resident sort of involvement because you've got uh, a rollout of technical of conditions. Yeah which are then in often internal communications between officers and the developer because they're condition after condition on large schemes. Mm. It's unending, isn't it, you know? Yeah. It, it is legally possible to start building work before you've got building rights consent. Yeah. But in that case, you do it at your own risk. That's what this was. And the uh, building inspector can come along and say, you've got to demolish all that and start again because it's not not true. Yeah. But they did they, 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 they came and they inspected it sixteen times and they didn't uh, they, they, they didn't uh, I'm confident yeah. Yeah. my question is on final inspection, yes? Yeah. Uh, no matter if you start before or what else in between at the end of the day you have to sign it off as being work yeah. fit for the purpose and yeah. meeting all the regulations. Yeah. Now, based on what you have been explaining, uh, it is done but not done. Yeah. And so, what is the final position? Was it ever done? Yeah, it sounded like it was certified. I think it is because the way in which you do it, if you go down the full plans route, you get a different kind of certificate at the end of it, it sounds like. As yet, I'm not an expert in this, actually. Um, but I think it sounds like it was approved, but because it didn't go through the full plans route, they couldn't certify it in the same way. So I think it's, it's a kind of technicality. I think they will probably say it was certified as building regulations approved. I suspect, again, this is just me suspecting, that they will argue that it was, it was compliant. Because that will also get them off the... They will, it's about pointing the blame. Sorry, I shouldn't say that. But I mean, yeah. Uh, but you're right. It's, 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 it's not obvious. To me, it's not obvious. So. Um, I've got a question kind of going right back to the other end of the process and the CDM responsibilities. Did anyone at any point do a fire modelling exercise of that building? Because that surely would have been a CDM yep. chief contractor or whoever was responsible for that. And particularly, particularly given um, previous incidents uh, surrounding these claims. So, whilst the building might have been compliant with all of these individual regulations, there still is a duty to manage that risk, to be aware of that risk. And it goes back to your very first point about a building being more than the sum of its parts. So the building has been, in regulation terms, broken down into yes. each of its parts. Absolutely. And the CDM, my understanding of the CDM regulations is, is that there should be someone who actually is accountable for the whole building and does that kind of work. Yeah. I think that's a really good point, which is about very much about the way also the materials are tested. 
So again, you know, this thing can be tested um, at this scale um, and might comply with some regulations, but for the scale of a, of a, of a kind of, you know, 27 storey high building, it operates completely differently, to a different system. And I think you're right, there's a gap there, again, it goes back to James, gaps between this, the element that you're talking about, which is one panel, um, and the way it operates when it's, you know, when it's, um, you know, 20 storeys yeah, high. And, and, and that, that work would have cost money. So it's not yeah. just saving money on yeah. inferior materials, yeah. it's saving money on not doing proper design work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was thinking that because, I mean, we all know about chimneys, you know? And a fire needs air, and it needs... And, and I'm just a lay person, I'm just somebody who's nobody. But surely, at the beginning, right at the beginning, they should have... This chimney effect, yeah. whether the cladding or the fancy bits were fireproof, and there was a fire, it would have gone up anywhere because of the chimney effect. So whoever designed it, designed within it a chimney effect. I mean, is this why it is banned Straight in America, America and I think Germany as well, for buildings and Germany, banned on buildings over six stories, is it? There's one point I'd like to make about this cascade of responsibility, and that is there was a very disastrous fire back in the 70s at a, um, a place called Summerland on the Isle of Wight where uh, there was a loss of life, considerable loss of life. And the, uh, there was a public inquiry, and the findings of that inquiry, one of their important conclusions was that it was this dispersal of responsibility between subcontractors, sub-subcontractors, sub-sub-subcontractors, where nobody was getting a grip of the situation as a totality. And, uh, of course, in, under the old situation, that would be the architect together with their professional consultants. And I think that's a lot to do with what happened here. Yeah. Just no, so before about councils, let's please also remember that it's central government as well, which yeah. is uh, driving um, this absolutely. opportunity to try and make sure that everything in our lives yeah. is going yeah. to yeah. Absolutely right. Very glad both of you made that point yeah. because that's the next slide that I'm going to show. <laughs> Going back to this gentleman's question over here, why was this deadly cladding put on? Now, the reason they the reason they kind of saying about it was to put insulation on the building and improve its 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 performance. We've looked at the planning application and what it consistently says about the reason for the cladding is its appearance that it was overwhelmingly cosmetic. Is it? Okay, due to its height, the tower is visible from the adjacent Avondale Conservation Area to the south and the Labrick Grove, uh, the Labrick Conservation to the west. The changes to the existing tower will improve its appearance, especially when viewed from the surrounding area. So not from inside, from outside. The materials were chosen, quote, to accord with the development plan by ensuring that the character and appearance of the area are preserved and living conditions of those living near the development, yeah. not inside it, are suitably protected. Yeah. Can you believe this? It goes on, the reclad materials and new windows will present a significant improvement to the environmental performance of the beer building and its physical appearance. Yeah. It concludes, the development will provide significant improvements to the physical appearance of the tower. This was a regeneration, yeah? But Grenfell Tower is part, or was part, is part, of a regeneration of this entire area, this entire ward. Now what I'm showing you here is the original master plan which was drawn up by um, a group called Urban Initiatives for the council in 2009. And the, the people on the, the estate here, they call this the kind of the scorched earth policy, it means demolish the whole lot. Um, Grenfell Tower would be about here, um, this is Silchester Estate over here, people that we know, which is still up for demolition and redevelopment, entire demolition and redevelopment. Um, to the bottom here, these are the th two wings left of the Lancaster West Estate. The third one would be demolished. And it also involved all this redevelopment, demol demolition and redevelopment here. Um, let me just read you out some of these uh, 
This is from, this is from, this is what they wanted to do originally to this estate. It says, the executive summary is the area suffers from housing stock in need of ongoing and expensive refurbishment. A range of social, social deprivation and other issues often associated with large post-war housing estates. This context means that land values are artificially depressed closer to the centre. The far-sighted option, this is the one here, uh, aims to maximise overall value in the long term and create a high quality new neighbourhood. This requires a number of significant interventions. We estimate that the project could deliver significant returns to the council. In order to present the most attractive offer in a competitive bidding process, the winning consortium would need to adopt the most optimistic approach to cost and or values. Now, it says about Grenfell Tower, which is right at the centre of this, this, uh, this, this refurbishment, the regeneration rather. We consider that the appearance of this building and the way in which it meets the ground blights much of the area east of Lat Latimer Road, which runs down here. It also provides no outdoor space for residents. The reason it has got no outdoor space for residents is they built an academy here on its, um, on its uh, playing, playing fields. That's the first thing that they've done. Now that part of the regeneration has actually been built. They've lost all their playing fields there. In fact, we were told by residents that the refurbishment of Grenfell Tower, the cladding, was seen as presented to them as a kind of an exchange for giving up their playing fields. It also said it is likely to be, this is Grenfell Tower, a type of construction that is hard to adapt. It says it does contain 120 homes, but on balance, our preferred approach is to assume demolition. We're running out of time, so I won't go through all this. If you want to have a look about this afterwards, I think this says pretty conclusively that the reasons for the cladding of this building were only ostensibly to insulate it. They were to improve the, the appearance of it. Because, of course, 2009, I think by the time they drew this up, the market in luxury housing, you know, they got the financial crash and so on. So they went to the second option. This is the early value option. This is when the returns on it are accrued much more quickly. In this case, Grenfell Tower is here. The academy gets built. The whole of Silterester Estate here gets demolished and redeveloped. And the uh, Lancaster West Estate here um, remains and gets refurbished. That's actually what happened. So this suggests that the master plan, even though it's been adapted to a less scorched earth policy, and in other words, it's only demolishing this, building this, and recladding that, this is the master plan behind why Grenfell Tower was refurbished. Now, I'm just going to say very, very quickly, what I'm, the point I'm trying to get here is that the regeneration of our states, this is not something which is local to Grenfell Tower or even to Silchester Estate. It's being carried out as a matter of policy, um, across London, and it's actually a national strategy now. There is a, a state regeneration national strategy which is targeting a hundred estates which they call sink estates for regeneration. Um, there are, that we know of, well, there's, at least, there's probably at least 200 estate regeneration programmes going on in London itself. And one of the things I also want to say is that this disaster has been taken up as an attack on the Tory government. Now, nobody hates the Tory government more than me, but there are, London is council-led, it is a Labour city. And that we know of, there are 155 estate regeneration schemes being carried out in Labour boroughs alone by Labour councils. So this is not a choice between Labour and Tory, this is a cross-party estate regeneration programme, and it's also housing policy of both the Labour and the Tory parties. The reason that councils give for regeneration range, uh, one, of the one, one of the key ones are, the estate has fallen into decline and we don't have the money to refurbish it. Um, now, as Jane Rendell will tell you, the, um, the, um, the, 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 the estimated cost of refurbishing the Ellsbury estate, which is just down the road from here, was estimated, how many years ago now, at 58% the cost, up to 58% the cost of its, of its uh, demolition and redevelopment. By then, by now, I think it's gone, it's gone way, way less than that, hasn't it? Demolition and redevelopment always costs much, much more 
known refurbishment. Um, I think in uh, 2006 or something like that, they estimated that the cost of demolishing each unit is £50,000 alone. Um, the work that we do in Ash shows that the argument that we can't afford to refurbish estates is simply a lie. It's always cost much more to redevelop them. Of course, what that means when you do redevelop is you get in all those private contractors and PFI deals which, which actually pay for it. But the argument that, that um, Labour councils give, or particularly that, that Southwark responded to my point there, was to ignore the fact that refurb was cheaper as an option and to say they had no funding source to refurb. So then you get into an argument about how the funding sources for the councils work and how that's distributed or not from central government and why certain Labour councils go into these um, arrangements and partnerships with private developers. Sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, the, the reason why I don't buy that one is because if that was the case, why does Southwark make such horrendous deals with developers and end up with two million pounds whilst the developer gets 170 million pounds? Yeah. So, so we're talking about the uh, the Haygate deal yeah, where they've got to get contracts. I am a lawyer, so I'm looking at it from a lawyer's perspective. I've worked with lots of social housing tenants in West London and Lambeth over many years. And I agree with everything that you've said, sorry I don't know your name. Um, particularly, I think that it's not a party politics thing. Over successive years, all governments, whether it's Labour or Tory, have favoured deregulation. Yeah. One of the perspectives that I find most interesting is about Kensit, the model of the KCTMO. Yeah. Yeah. I have advocated for many years that the KCTMO is unaccountable in its structure. I mean, it is interesting that Grenville uh, Action Group were actually the voice of the tenants. Mm -hmm. Means that actually they're setting up these tenant management organisations, but the real voice is not there. And we need to rethink that model, including the fact that the regulator is now um, a quango called the um, uh, Homes and Communities Agency. They do not, they're not bothered about regulating whether tenants are happy. And in fact, the regulator made that clear. He's really only interested in the financial side, what they call the economic standard, not the consumer standard. Because at the moment, they're not accountable to anyone. They're really accountable to the council. They've got a very close link with the council. Just, just a very quick point as well, I'm only I'm speaking about Southwark, is that also the relationship that the councillors have with the developers is also a massive problem. And there's no restrictions on basically them sh switching over. We've had a number of key councillors who have switched over to jobs in developers. Yeah, I, I think there's a, another point to raise, which is the race to the bottom in terms of building materials, quality, yeah. things like this. Not just in, in public housing, but in private housing. I uh, go past the new Battersea Power Station development in situ concrete, that's fine. Plywood, Tyvek, Kingspan, hammered, a hammered copper finish. If that burns, that will burn. Now, you might say, well, they're people in half a million pound flats. They've probably got sprinklers and blah, 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 blah. And they're probably empty anyway. That's not the point. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, is that the government, the councils allow shoddy building practice to become the norm. That's it. But there is a further incentive which is driving demolition and rebuild as opposed to refurb. And that is the inequitable application of VAT. That you have a 20% incentive to demolish and rebuild in that all new housing is totally exempt from VAT. The, the only refurb work which is VAT exempt is work which is to do with reducing CO2 emissions. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing is that they need to build more homes. There's this housing crisis on, there's a housing shortage. Now, this is one of the most dangerous kind of arguments because what they say is we demolish an estate with, say, a thousand homes on it, but we build two and a half thousand in place. And they always say the residents on it, tenants or leaseholders, have a right to return. This is the thing that Sadiq Khan, our London Mayor, is always saying. Now, there is, in 2016,
Um, the Homes and Community Agency promised 4.7 billion quid to for the Affordable Homes Programme. Help to buy it, help them to build it. Um, that, when they, when they demolish estates, when they demolish council homes or when they demolish housing association estates, homes for social rent, which is up to a third of, of market rent, are systematically being replaced with affordable housing. Now, affordable housing, it can mean, like everyone kind of knows that it means up to 80% of market rate. It's actually worse than that. What is primarily being built in place of demolished homes for social rent is shared ownership properties. Um, shared ownership properties, you need 25% to buy into it. But the kind of buildings they're building in central London or inner London at the moment, for a two bedroom home is somewhere between £660,000 to £700,000. Um, you need 25% of that. But it's even worse than that because until the buyer owns 100% of the estate, they actually are only assured tenancies. On it, yeah. and if they default in any way, they not only lose the home, they lose their deposit on it as well. So I think it's one of the most extraordinary scams the, the I've ever heard. Of. Of buying is almost the cost that the people yeah. used to pay yeah. before. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's a lot of talk so about they people. can't afford it, no. so they are moved out of the yes. area, yeah. which there's a word for it. I don't want to call it because of. Is it? Uh, yeah. But there's a. You everybody can call it for me. There's a word for it. Actual like what, what is it? What is happening is that we are no longer able to live. Yeah. That's why we are so against estate regeneration, because estate renovate regeneration means demolition and redevelopment. What gets redeveloped, what gets put in its place, is not affordable. Yeah, yeah. Certainly not the private homes but not even the affordable quota. Yeah, affordable housing is not affordable anymore to anyone, unless they've got enough money to kind of, you know, buy the private room themselves. That's why in the middle of a housing crisis, and imagine a housing shortage, because it's actually not a crisis of supply, it's a crisis of affordability. There's lots of homes in this, in this city. We can't let these homes be demolished because what's replacing them is effectively an instrument of social cleansing. The people who are in them do not come back. That's what we know. We've even looked into studies that the more homes you supply, the more people move into a city, which drives up the prices. Yeah. Building more homes does, it seems, you know, you, you kind of hear this like, it's a simple question of supply and demand. That's not the way economics works. Supply does not reduce prices. Supply more actually puts prices up. Um, I went to a um, so-called consultation, which was um, on, in Pekka, on Rye Lane, about the shopping centre, the Elsham shopping centre. So I went to one of them and I was like standing up and saying, well, how many council homes homes are you going to build in this 1,000 flats? And they said they wouldn't say it. And it was all like secret, secret. And then now you look at the Batsy Power Station, they're saying there's going to be no affordable flats and of course no council flats. Anyway, what happened in the end is when the meeting finished, they had like an undercover security guard in the meeting. And he comes up to me and he goes, what's your name? And all this, like trying to get information from me. Luckily, I know, because I've been in this situation loads of times. And I was like, who are you? He said, who paid for you to be here? He said, oh, I'm like, a, um, kind of like, a, not anger management, but you know, like trying to like, um, like the UN would do, yeah, like some diplomatic kind of like professional that helps to consult and all this. And I was like, so what? Like, who paid for you to be here? Was it the council or the developer? And he wouldn't say. What you just talked about in terms of being being accosted by this guy, I mean, clearly that's also, we saw that happening at Grenfell Action Group. Yeah. Two of those people, weren't they, they were threatened with legal action, yeah. for objecting to what was going on. Yeah. This is happening all the time. All the kind of consultations that we've been involved with have had some form of bullying um, that's been discussed, and yeah, you're absolutely right. So just on the political issue, I think it's really important to stress a point here that it's absolutely right, it's been cross-party successive governments that have all pursued <laughs> A single policy which is not in fact unique to social housing, it is a general policy of public asset stripping. Britain is selling everything all the time to private developers. There are lots and lots of reasons for that, but it's a general direction of travel that's been present for a very long time across all parties, no doubt about it at all. It's almost like an anathema, you shouldn't own things publicly, things should be owned privately and the public services should be minimalist and should be there just to deal with emergencies, not very well as it transpires, but that's the type of service we're looking at. That has been the cross-party position, but don't for a minute think this issue is not political. Yeah. It's deeply, deeply political, yeah. and therefore it's susceptible to change. It can actually change, 
And I think we're starting to see some of that. Maybe not in local, local authority councils. That has to dribble down. It also has to change at the macro level. The borrowing requirements for local authorities would have to change. But we shouldn't give up on the political process because actually it's the only way we're going to get out of this. Yeah. It's the only way you can seriously fight against the macro rules which dictate what happens at the local authority level. And I've got this feeling, I don't know what other people think, that Grenfell is going to become this huge symbol of what has gone wrong with this whole process of public asset stripping and pretending we're doing things for the public good where in fact it's for private gain. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully we will help make that Enactment of what happened in the 70s, where uh, local authorities in central London put local authorities like yeah. our area under under stress to just literally ship people out. Yeah. We think yeah. that communities yeah. are valuable everywhere, and I don't say this in a way like I'm not coming here saying, "Oh, please don't come." But we also have thousands and thousands of empty properties in yeah. Mark, in yeah. our yeah. area, yeah. Yeah. which yeah. is an absolute outrage. Yeah. I want to give the, particularly the residents of uh, these three blocks some words of reassurance that the characteristics that caused the disaster at Grenville Tower in no way relate to these structures. We've already heard earlier on that the whole theory about fire safety in this country is dependent on compartmentalisation. That is to say, avoiding the spread of fire from one property to another. And um, in, this, um, in these structures, you have one hour compartmentalization, which means that um, the, uh, the actual structure itself will withstand an intense fire for one hour. The doors which give out into the escape routes from within the dwellings are half hour rated and the doors into the fire escape staircase are half hour rated so altogether you have one hour on the doors as well now you also have in every maisonette in this building alternative means of escape something which was not the case at Grenville Tower you will know if you are familiar with your plan, this I've marked up in red here what the escape route is. This is the staircase here. I'm sorry if those people over there can't see everything, but I shall leave this drawing here. This is the main entrance floor where your living accommodation is. You go upstairs to your bedroom, your bedrooms, and from the bedroom, level, you also have an escape door into a subsidiary corridor. Now, that is, is very important that these corridors are never cluttered with any obstructions and particularly nothing that is flammable. So that is something you need to check because when you understand how the fire safety system works, it does need to be checked from time to time, if necessary, together with a fire officer who will advise you. So the doors, which you ha will hardly ever use, hopefully will never have to use, from your bedroom floor onto the escape route, do not put heavy furniture in front of those doors. You must be able to use them quickly. And all fire escape doors open in the direction of travel, the direction of escape. That's quite deliberate. So they will lead you to the staircase. Another difference between, which we've already mentioned, these blocks and the Grenville Tower, is you have no gas. Not only did you have an unprotected gas main rising in the escape route, it ruptured. So God knows what that did to accelerate the fire. You have here a dry riser in every block. A dry riser is an empty pipe, empty of water that is, but it's full of compressed air. And the, the fire brigade will come along and link that to a hydrant or link it to a tank of water that they have 
brought with them and they will pump it up. This is much the most efficient way for them to get the water to the site of the fire rather than carrying a very long hose up a staircase. Now one of the reasons for the policy of uh, remain in your dwelling uh, and, and wait to be rescued, except for the one where the fire is of course, is that the, the fire brigade will also want to use the staircase to come up and fight the fire. And if the, 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 their um, access is impeded by streams of people running down the stairs, that will only slow things down. Well, so if everyone, like most of us, is downstairs, I would not stay put. I would take my kids and go downstairs. <laughs> Where should I go up on the stairs? Where should I go? Uh, there's this, this guy here wants to say something as well. Hi, yeah. Uh, my name's Neil Wallace. I'm chair of the Residents Association for uh, the three blocks just over the road on the Edinburgh Estate. Uh, all of which only have one staircase to get out. All of which have cladding, which, as far as I know, is not exactly the same kind. But we're still waiting to find out just exactly what kind it is. So, in a sense, uh, we have a different series of priorities. One of my concerns, though, is that I am hearing over and over again, and completely understandably, people saying, uh, well, if there's any kind of fire, I'm just going to get out. And there's a real danger that we create a different kind of problem here, because we had a fire recently yeah. in Brittany Point, which was contained in the right way. Mm. It was contained within the flat. That flat was gutted, but it didn't spread anywhere else. And uh, just the people in the immediate area were moved out, and everybody else stayed put. But if we have a situation in a block like ours where people are running down staircase, maybe there's smoke, maybe someone trips, maybe a light's out. Yeah. If people start forging on top of one another, you can have a completely different tragedy. Yeah. And so we must bear that in mind. I know it's difficult. I'm not saying I understand exactly where the, the, the uh, balance should be, but I'm just at least raising that issue mm. for people. Yeah, I think that's, that's a very good point about why it's so dangerous, this, kind of, this, this idea that these tower blocks are dangerous and you have to run out of them. If you don't know, Grenfell Tower had a fire in 2010. It was contained as it was meant to be, and the firemen came in and put it out. And the fire brigade have said exactly the same thing. If the reason, this idea that there's only got a single exit, fires are contained within these blocks. The ex Sorry, this has gone off now. The, 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 the stairs are for the fire brigade to get up and fight the fire. And if you've got the entire block suddenly running down it, emptying, as this gentleman said, that's going to lead to far worse problems. That's why this kind of store, this narrative which is taking hold that these blocks are not safe from fire is so very, very dangerous. There's a, there's a further point I want to make, and that is, you may be aware of this, that the big killer in any fire is smoke. Most people die of suffocation uh, before ever the fire reaches them. And uh, every fire separation door should be uh, stripped to exclude the air and uh, stop the air getting to the fire, for one thing, because, um, of course, uh, if you can starve the fire of oxygen, the fire will die anyway. Mm. And uh, they should also be strip with what's called an intumescent strip, which is um, a material that bubbles up when it gets to a certain temperature and seals the gap. Yeah. So uh, that's another thing to check on, on your fire doors. I just, just very quickly, um, just in terms of people uh, here, uh, today I went to get the fire risk assessment, which uh, has been, you know, Lambeth, they wrote to us and they said, uh, they obviously wrote to us following the fire and they said that they had um, recently done a fire risk assessment and that everything was kind of fine um, and so I thought okay well I'll go and get that fire risk assessment. The concierge stranger didn't have, didn't have a copy which I thought was a bit odd. Um, they are about to start what is called a stage four emergency uh, analysis so a fire risk assessment of all these blocks. Um, partly because he thinks that actually this wasn't done terribly well but the, the, the dry risers that you were talking about they don't mention on here, or rather the box isn't ticked. So I think you know this just goes back to us merely, really, really forcing the point to them that we want to make sure this is done properly. And also for the fire doors, I'm, I'm on the night team. The, the wind blows yeah. the fire doors open. Yeah. I've taken a video into them and shown them this, and I'm still waiting to hear back because there's never a jar. And I said that means if there's a wind, anyhow, it's going to escalate the fire down the corridor. 
Um, the, the issue there also is that leaseholders have a choice to have a fire door put on, whereas tenants are having the fire doors put on. So, um, uh, you know, there, there is another social um, separation going on there that actually puts everyone at risk. Yeah. Yeah. Briefly, talk about sprinters. The, what the fire rates say is that um, fire, you've got only a single means of escape, as of course was the case in Grenville Tower. Uh, there should be sprinklers, which there weren't. Where you've got alternative means of escape, you, play, you can get away without sprinklers. Those, of course, sprinklers would always be an additional safety. But certainly, every fire door should have a self-closer on it, an operating self-closer. And what I've just heard about uh, a fire door swinging in the wind, yeah. that yeah. is just not on. Yeah. Um, I started a petition online um, around the Love Canal um, inquest and um, basically said what happened after that. The, that took four years to mm. come out mm. um, and there were recommendations that came out from the coroner on that. Mm. Then the Department for Communities and Local Government said it was up to individual councils to decide whether or not they were actually going to take this recommendation. So what my petition is calling for is actually for the DCLG mm. to actually force councils mm. to do it. Mm. Um, so. As I say, I'm now trying to actually see whether I can get a meeting with DCLG. If anybody's able to help at all in that, I would much appreciate it. Um, extremely pertinent. Um, I'd just like to make the comparison with Roman Point. When the Roman Point disaster happened, this building was actually on site at the time, um, within six months, the building regs had been revised and new criteria were introduced whereby all big panel system structures had to go through a, um, a further strengthening to resist internal explosion, even though they weren't allowed to have gas. Four years after the Lacanel inquiry and recommendations, zero action. Yeah. The difference is political. Yeah. Yeah. I think that moves us very naturally onto what are we going to do about all this stuff. Yeah. Thank you for staying around in this very long meeting. I think it's important, though, that we, we, we do address this fourth point. It's like, what are we going to do with all this? What are we going to do with this knowledge? And not just let the meeting end here. Um, I said at the beginning that one of the things that we're most concerned about is the use that's being made of this fire to further promote what is already a very advanced estate demolition program. Um, <clears throat> we've got lovely people like Simon Jenkins in the Guardian calling residential towers are antisocial, high maintenance, disempowering, unnecessary, mostly ugly, and never truly safe. I know right there that he's never lived on one. You always find commentators, they talk about the buildings. I always feel they're talking about the people in them, the kind of the very emotional language they use. Andrew Grimson, Tory, although as I said, there's no difference. I would not ever want to live in one of those towers. I prefer my little terraced house. So, so if they can, do most people. Most people in... Oh, whatever. Yeah. A shoddy, this is how he describes uh, these blocks. A shoddy, second-rate solution, masquerading as some sort of progress. Lumpen, inhumane. Can't we tear down these repulsive blocks and get back to building the decent, modest streets where people actually want to live? Now, the redevelopment models which are being promoted by people like Savills and Create Streets, Think Tank and so on, are to demolish high-rise high blocks, council blocks, and redevelop them as mid-rise, very, very dense buildings. Strangely enough, that doesn't apply to the, <laughs> the enormously high tower blocks that people like Lenny are building just around the corner from here. Okay? So it's good. Doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't apply to the enormously go up. Um, but more, more dangerously, you've got David Lammy. Now, I know David Lammy, he's the MP for Tottenham, and I know he lost someone in the, in the fire, and he's been very emotional about this. But he said, there are 700 tower blocks of 11 stories or more in the capital alone. The vast majority were built in the 1960s and 70s. The conditions in Grenfell Tower are mirrored in housing estates across the country. We've seen tonight, that is not true. That's a very dangerous statement yeah. for an MP who has become almost like the spokesperson on this fire. Um, sorry, 
For decades, we've consigned people to live in overcrowded conditions that are not just unacceptable, but in many cases are criminally unsafe. And as an example of these criminally unsafe, he, wrote, he cited Broadwater Farm, the estate in Tottenham, which actually has one of the lowest crime rates of any open place in the entire country. Um, families live in hutches, not houses. It's very emotive language. Actually, we know that the buildings like this, they're far bigger proportions and far better built than the, the kind of rubbish that they're building in their place. He says, those some of these buildings, many of them should be demolished. Now, David Lambie is the MP for Tottenham. In his constituency, there are two estates, Broadwater Farm and um, Northumberland Park, thousands of homes which have been consigned, condemned to demolition and redevelopment by the Harringay Development Vehicle that the council, which is a Labour council, has just entered into as part of a two billion pound land sale. So I'm very suspicious about this guy using this fire, being very emotional about it. I'm not interested in what is his individual, but he's using this fire to promote something that is happening in his constituency. Sorry? Oh yes, um, the people who are um, who they've entered into this contract with, this two billion dead, uh, uh, HDV, this Harrogate Development Vehicle, is the International Property Developers Lend Lease. Oh. They're the ones who are rebuilding on the, the Haygate here. And as we know, they demolished 1,200 homes and they promised 82 for social rent. The last person is our lovely mayor. He says the greatest legacy of this tragedy may well end up being the skyline of our towns and cities. In the post-war rush to reconstruct our country, towers went up in large numbers, most of which are still here today. Nowadays, we would not dream of building towers to the standards of the 1970s. And we certainly wouldn't, because this rubbish that we're building nowadays is nowhere near the standards that we built then. But their inhabitants still have to live with that legacy. And this is the crucial bit. It may well be that the defining outcome of this tragedy, as he calls it, that the worst mistakes of the 60s and 70s are systematically torn down. Now, Sonny Khan in December, <laughs> Sonny Khan in December, the GLA, the Greater London Authority, published a draft good practice guide to estate demolition. Now, in this, in this, if you want to, if you want to know about this, go onto our, our blog, our website. We've written a a very, very long response to it. It was handed out to estate communities across London for their consultation. Um, and on it, amongst many other things, he removed the condition that there would be no demolition of a council estate if it led to a loss of social housing. Now, that condition has been completely removed and replaced first with, it can be replaced with affordable housing, but it actually can be replaced with high quality housing. You don't even need to build that as well. He also said originally in his when he was getting elected that he would make resident support for any estate regeneration exactly like Grenfell Tower or the full demolition a condition of it going ahead he's removed that and he's refused what many residents have called for which is a veto on the demolition of their estates the point i'm trying to make here is estate regeneration demolition as a policy which this mayor is absolutely behind is precisely replicating the privatization, the arm's length management, and the, um, the, the lack of accountability of councils, management organizations, which led directly to the Great Bell Fire, uh, fire Great Tower of Fire. Yeah. That's why we have to oppose it. So, what I want to do now, is what we've been doing for two years, and other people are doing for much longer, right. is we need to oppose this, but we also need to call for accountability from the people who are managing these homes. Yeah. I think we have to stop the management of people's homes over the people who are managing them as assets to, grow, to make profit out of them. We need to set up structures where the people who are in charge of people's homes are listening to the residents. Because what's come out of Grenfell, I think, most of all, is that the residents who genuinely, tragically, for four years, issued report after report after report to the TMO fearing for the safety of their lives from fire. And those reports were completely ignored. And as anyone who knows who works in campaigns to resist a state demolition, that arrogance, that lack of listening, the lack of accountability 
is replicated across this borough, across this city, across this country actually, whenever the state regeneration programs are coming in place. What I think, what I feel, or what they did around Grandfield, if you look at all the people they asked the question, they want professionals in, in what you are seeing and can analyze it. I, I, I can give you the tears if you want that. But it won't go anywhere. We need a body of professional, especially the lawyers. Because I've heard nothing about any class action no, suit. No. I've heard about criminal charges. I've heard a lot of stuff. But where is the body that coming in to say, well, okay, we are going to represent you and we are going to ask for a, a, a 200 million so we know somebody will feel the pain of it. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think you should underestimate how much there is um, a concern across a lot of a lot of professions about this issue. Sorry, sorry, I mean, sorry. Ash themselves have uh, demonstrated that this evening in terms of being architects trying to mobilise people around these issues, and the lawyers will respond. There's, there's other lawyers in this room, I suspect, who would take a similar view. The difficulty, I suppose, fundamentally, is this: that what the law can't really do is what the politicians have the unique and sole ability to do, which is make political judgments. What lawyers can do is try and call out those political judgments as not being sound or being in contravention of certain pre-existing principles. But in order to really mount a serious campaign to stop these types of things, it needs to be multifaceted. You need to have the lawyers doing what they're doing, you need to have the campaigners doing what they're doing, you need to have the experts willing to give their time for free, exactly as you're saying, sir. So to do that, we do need an active organisation with a singular body, and then the, the law will follow that, and the cases will definitely follow that. It's not a shortage of expertise, perhaps it's a shortage of time and coming together and organisation, but hopefully today, today is the, the beginning of that process. Sorry, I just wanted to make a really quick uh, point about the, uh, the culture of uh, subcontracting and then subcontracting again. The, one of the myths about this uh, thing is that it's, it's about efficiency and saving money. In fact, it often doubles and trebles the cost of what things should cost. And, and we need to nail them on the fact that this is a grossly inefficient way. It's not just about lack of accountability and the fact that it's very difficult to get anything done to hold people to account. But every company it goes through, every manager it goes past, takes a slice out of that public purse, the money we've paid to get a service, and they're all putting a, a, you know, a, a brown envelope in their back pocket in effect, and we're getting a, a, a worse service at a higher price. Just a couple of thoughts on uh, where you could go politically with, with, within certain things is that all, all, all housing associations should have at least six residents on, trained and on their board at any one time and that the Homes and Communities Agency or something similar, there should be a proper housing ombudsman that look, can look into malpractice and how things go wrong and what can do to put it right. So that there's actually teeth within the system. Political solutions, I'll be very practical. Lewisham Hospital campaign, it won and it stopped Lewisham a &E from getting closed down by the central government's cuts. That is a Labour borough as well and so forth and so forth. It's been said already. But how it was won is that there was 20,000 people out on the streets yeah. and they blocked the whole of Lewisham and they said, we're not going away until you stop doing this. Yeah. That is a massive threat to the powers that are listening and they, they you know, sit up and listen when that happens. They get shocked. They say, why is you know, this you know, um, sort of it, you know, person that's not politically connected or not in a trade union or you know, not part of some organisation? Why are they out in the street? They, they shouldn't care. Well, they do, and they've been, you know, they've gained consciousness of some kind, and they've taken a day off, and they're out in the street. Then later, there was a um, judicial review, and they took the government to court. The government, they won, and then the government um, appealed, and then they won the appeal as well. But they, the, the kind of error that they made in some ways is they made it a purely legal campaign after a certain point. And all of that energy, all those people that got trained up and sort of mobilized, were never mobilized again. And I think that they did a fantastic job and I supported them thoroughly, you know, till the end and all the rest of it. But I think that we can't have a purely legal campaign. It has to, and like, you know, going to your writing to your MP and all that, do that as well, whatever. But what needs to happen is a change in the whole political landscape by getting out on the street and yeah. people just saying, 
We're not going to go away until you bloody open that fire escape. We're going to come to the council and protest and pick at your door at nine in the morning and stop you going to work. Yeah. And then they listen and then they do it. And then you get what you want. The other fine example is the Comrades t-shirt, Focus E15. They went into housing offices and they sat on the floor, 20 of them, and said, we're not getting out until this person gets rehoused in the borough. No, you can't send them to Liverpool or whatever. We're not moving until you rehouse them. And they got hundreds of people rehoused from the Focus E15 housing unit and just people that came to them and wanted to fight. And then a whole group of people got involved. That's how I know so many other people, because we met through this active campaign that everyone took part in. And it's probably the biggest housing campaign in the country. Yeah, this it's not a trade union campaign or anything like it's just people that got together and done it in different groups and different supporters and so forth. So I think there's something to be learned in that and we should go to the streets and block the streets and go to the council and the bloody private companies that are involved. Yeah. You know, yeah. Radon Rider. Yeah. You know, this guy that owns it or whatever has the biggest shares took home a million last year. The company, what, they got eight million for that refurb. How much did it cost them? Probably four million. Yeah, the rest is just money in their pocket. Mm -hmm. So we have to target all of these people. I'm hoping that people are going to be able to mobilise on the back of what happened at Grenfell because obviously across London everybody who lives on estates that have high tower blocks are, are urgently concerned about the situation. Now everybody is going to have to act within their own tenants organisations to put pressure on their relevant councils, whoever's managing those properties. While that's happening we need people who are going to build the connections between the different groups. And I hope that that can feed into the bigger demand, which is that people are saying, while we're talking to you and making demands on you, we don't want you turning around to us and saying, we're going to demolish your homes for your own good. Because the point of this that you're making so clearly is that these are not homes that, that there is a problem with. So I can volunteer my services. I think what Ash is doing is amazing. I hope more people can get involved. Your list of all the councils that are under threat by Labour, I'm a journalist and activist. It's something I'm still trying to find the time to look into. We need more people who can come on board to do more of these things. We need people who can join groups of people in different places to one another and who are prepared to offer time. I'm prepared to offer time. I hope other people are as well. Lawyer, I just wanted to echo really what Jamie said. Um, there are lots of lawyers out there who are thinking about these issues and who are thinking about where the gaps are and what legal remedies might be appropriate to try and fill those gaps and meetings like this are the first stage in making connections between lawyers who are interested in these issues and residents and hearing residents' concerns and talking to groups of residents and making those connections and thinking about going forward. But I also agree that legal remedies aren't the only solution here. I think it needs to be a concerted yeah. effort. It's a, political, um, it's a political problem as well as a legal one. I think we need to, to think about a sort of holistic approach to it. I agree with that and I think that um, having a skills base and a forum, what you've done tonight I think is brilliant and all the work that you do and I think bringing all these different types of skills together maybe this could be more like a regular meeting that, that we would have yeah, as a forum yeah. to discuss. Yeah. I do think though, speaking for my own profession, architecture, I don't think architects are doing enough in general. Um, most of them won't speak out at public inquiries because of client interest, and no. they put that above sure. public interest. But I think if there are enough people who were, are prepared to spend time and share skills, I think we need some QSs on board pretty yes. badly. That's a real skill that's missing. Quantity surveillance. Uh, quantity yes. surveillance. Uh, for costings, that's really, really key. And I do think that the legal side is really important because that's like a a kind of fire stop in a way. Yeah. What we discovered with the Aylesbury is people put in so much work on lots of different issues, but the only one that actually stuck was the issue to do with human rights and to do with the equalities assessment. And no one would have known that without a legal background. Right. So I do think that we have to recognise what it is that the different professions can do and how they can kind of jam some of these processes. And I would suggest that everyone who goes back if you go back to an estate, if you go back to a TRA, anywhere, have a meeting like this with your with the people that you're with. So take something away from this, go back, meet, have, put, have a meeting next week in your estate, wherever you are, in your community. Talk about this with them. Think about the ways in which your local community is affected by this. 
Is there something happening in your area? Are you confronted with the possible possibility of needing, uh, I don't know, some kind of refurbishment coming up soon? Is there a problem with this? And I think it's about, it's really saying it's about people coming together, but it's also about what you do when you leave this room. Because you're all, as you say, you're coming from that gentleman there, he's from Barnet or whatever. There's stuff happening over there, and you need to be, you need to be doing that stuff over there and then bringing it back in again. So I think just, you know, if, if everybody from this room goes back and starts that little conversation over there, that would be really, really important thing to do. One of the most terrible things I think that came out of this terrible disaster is, I think it was three years ago, the Grenfell Action Group said they thought it would take a tragic fire, a disaster like this, to get the council to listen to them. Unfortunately, it has, but it's also taken, I think, this to get London to suddenly be aware of what's going on. And we need to get our message out there, to get the truth out there, and not allow what's actually happening at the moment. Because what we've learned through fighting a state demolition is the people doing this, they manage opposition. We've already seen, in relation to what that guy was saying over there, we've already seen that the papers are trying to divide people into those with a, with a, a, a just grievance and all those nasty little activists and housing gamers getting on it. They're already trying to say, who can protest? Who can be upset? Who's got a legitimate case in this? And we can't accept that. And we need to oppose this. OK, um, I think the best way we can honor the dead in this terrible, terrible disaster is to speak the truth about what happened here. And because at the moment, Grenfell Town's like a mirror. The conditions that produced it are being replicated in our reactions to it. And we can't allow that to happen. OK, thanks for coming. Thank